I'm Dean Walker, and welcome to the Poetry of Predicament podcast, a podcast for people brave enough to face humanity's challenges and problems, and most importantly, our numerous predicaments. The Poetry of Predicament is a podcast meant to inspire us to bring forth grace, beauty, and connection with the web of life in the face of a predicament-laden world. This time around, we're going to be talking with thought leader and peace activist Robert Burroughs, one of the few people I've come across in the entire Dumasphere that connects violence with not only the human systems collapsing, but also the environmental systems collapsing. An extraordinary conversation with a truly remarkable thought leader, Robert Burroughs. So I, um, I'm really excited to be uh, speaking with today's guest on the Poetry of Predicament podcast, and that's uh, our guest is Robert Burroughs. And I've really just met Robert a few moments ago, and we've just started sharing a bit. Uh, I've been quite moved by uh, some of Robert's writings recently and reached out to to see if we could connect and, and we could have this conversation. And I've got to say, you know, we haven't, we, we, again, barely know each other, but I'd like to start, Robert, with an acknowledgement that, um, you know, <clears throat> I was just sharing with you how uh, profound the experience was for me of really cracking open to what's going on in life in this this time that we happen to be alive in and what are the really important issues and um you're one of the very few that i've found that is actually i don't know if it's courageous enough i don't know if it's crazy enough i don't know what the right words are but to bring your focus to the concept of peace and to me, that's that's uh, that's an appropriate scale concept for the uh, predicament we find ourselves in. And I've been literally flabbergasted by how few people talk about the the violence and the scale of violence, which I include in that, by the way, everything that we're going through with regard to abrupt climate change, the collapse of earth and human systems. It's all violence across the board from my perspective. So I've been so looking forward to speaking with you because you have stepped forward to to put that kind of context together as well. So I I so want to hear about your projects and your partners in in the projects, whatever you'd like to share with us about that. But I'm wondering if you would be so kind as to introduce yourself to the to the audience of poetry of predicament and uh and robert welcome thanks very much dean i'm very happy to be here so if i do introduce myself um my own story has to start with the simple fact that um during World War Two, World War Two, my father was a coast watcher, and um, he was uh, stationed up in uh, Papua New Guinea. Um, but uh, the bigger part of the story is that my father was not the only member of his family who was posted during World War Two. Both of his brothers were as well, and tragically, my father was the only one of the three of them who came home. And uh, obviously, if he hasn't, I wouldn't be here today. But uh, during my childhood, um, from a very young age, my father used to take my brother and I off to a, um, a commemorative service uh, at the Shrine of Remembrance in Melbourne. And uh, these services were designed to commemorate uh, a particular event during World War II. And that was the sinking of the Montevideo Maru. The Montevideo Maru was a Japanese prisoner of war ship, which was sunk, unfortunately, by a US submarine, not realising that the, the Japanese ship 
had uh, 1,053 Australian prisoners of war on it. And one of those prisoners of war was my uncle, my father's older brother, who was named Robert. And um, obviously some years after the war when my father got married and he and my mother had a child, which was me, they named me after his older brother. So Bob was killed on the 1st of July, 1942, and um, because he was one of those 1,053 Australian prisoners on the Montevideo Maru. Um, my father's twin brother, Tom, was a wireless air gunner on a Beaufort bomber, and he was shot down on the 13th of December, 1943, and all members of the crew on his uh, aircraft were killed. So my entire childhood had this very faint and gentle backdrop, if you like, of commemorative services at the Shrine of Remembrance or elsewhere to commemorate the fact that, uh, you know, Australians, like many people around the world, had lost um, members of their population during World War II or other wars, of course. And, um, and just as I grew up, um, I would find myself asking the question, why? Why was my uncle killed? Or why were my uncles killed? Why did my father have to go and fight in a war? And um, I used to ask occasionally that question to people, including my father, but I never got an answer that I felt really did justice um, and gave me an explanation that, if you like, made full sense to me. So I grew up with this background of a father who didn't really talk about the war. He didn't. Um, my mother also served in World War II, which was unusual. Very few women did. Um, neither of them talked much about the war. Um, but it just came up because of these commemorative services and because of my two uncles being killed. Um, it was just a, a persistent background presence. And because I kept finding myself asking this question, why? I mean, why do humans engage in this large scale fight where lots of people are killed, you know? So to cut a long story short, by the time I turned 14 um, in 1966, I decided that um, when I grew up and I got a job, I was gonna work out why human beings kill each other. And um, the good news is that when you're only 13 or 14, everything seems possible. So you can be quite idealistic. And, um, and I believe that uh, there would be a lot of interest in the answer to that question. And in fact, I, I actually thought the answer was there. I just had to sort of read a book or something. And um, having understood the problem more fully myself, then I would spend time trying to help other people appreciate that uh, perhaps we can do better than fighting wars where we kill a lot of people. Well, of course, I uh, went on to finish school and then went to university and I studied uh, courses that interested me all with the intention of trying to get a clearer sense of why humans fight wars. And of course, as I quickly found out, um, there wasn't an easy answer to that question of why humans fight wars and there wasn't an easy answer to the question of why humans are violent. And you can read quite a bit of literature that purports to give some version of an answer to that. So, um, yeah, so I went on to do a, a lot more study and research at university. Uh, you always with the focus of trying to better us understand why humans are violent. And I, uh, despite even three university degrees, I never found the answer to that question. So finally, in 1996, uh, my wife Anita McCone and I decided to go into seclusion and spend 14 years taking apart our own minds. So we lived in seclusion. It took 14 years, which uh, we hadn't anticipated. Uh, and it was at the end of that time that I felt like I finally understood the answer to the fundamental question I'd posed myself in 1966. And that was the answer to the question of why human beings are violent, of which war, of course, is a subset. And, um, because uh, during my childhood, I'd been very aware too that, you know, kids were starving to death in Africa, Central and South America and Asia, and, uh, and we were destroying the environment. I was sort of well aware that it wasn't war that was the only issue. There were other big issues 
but of course the core was that they're all examples of violence, which you observed before too. So yes. um, the fact yeah. that we're engaging... If I, could, if, if I could just stop you for, for a second, Robert, I, I, uh, I just want to... <laughs> I, I was just literally dropped my jaw when you said you took 14 years, you, your wife and yourself, to to explore this perhaps most fundamental question about the fatal flaws of being a human being. How is it that we are so destructive? How is it that we are so committed to a violence-saturated human operating system and so you two took it on to explore that and to find to get to the roots of that is that more is that fair enough to say yes because all the reading i'd ever done didn't feel like it gave me answers that i felt were adequate and i was yeah. a reasonable researcher i mean i did three degrees so i have some idea Spectacular. I, I don't know. I don't. I wish I could ask you a, a stronger question right now. I'm just really nonplussed by your commitment to just getting to the root of such an important question. Again, a question that precious few people seem to be engaged with then and now. So it's just an extraordinary thing. Um, perhaps we can get to some of what that was like, you know, after you share a bit more with us. But uh, you know, I, you got my attention. <laughs> you got my attention. So is, I didn't mean to stop you. Were you wanting to just kind of uh, take us to the end of that 14 years and, and what you then formulated out of that? Is that where you were headed? Yes, and just briefly, um, because it felt like I'd finally understood the answer to the fundamental question, why are human beings violent? Um, it had always been my intention that once I understood the answer well, that I would spend time acting on the knowledge I'd acquired by mm -hmm. understanding the answer to that question and uh, raise awareness of therefore why humans are violent and of course offer people um, strategies for addressing it. And particularly by focusing on, on the fundamental cause, because if we take the destruction of the climate, the destruction of the environment generally, war, um, the exploitation of peoples in Africa, Asia, Central and South America, the exploitation of working people in Western countries, um, violence against women, I mean, violence against Indigenous people, the issues go on and on. Um, but obviously, um, if they've got a, a, a core um, a fundamental explanation that explains all these symptoms, manifestations of violence, if you like, then, um, then obviously uh, we're going to have far more um, effectiveness in addressing each of these manifestations by um, dealing with the cause. And I guess I'd always understood as a child that, um, even as a child, I don't know why, I just did, but um, it just made sense to me that if you're going to have a strategy to fix a problem, you're better off to have a, a clear understanding of the cause and then your strategy can be focused on addressing the cause. And if it's not, you could spend a lot of time doing things that may appear useful, which are a complete waste of time. And, and sadly, uh, without you know being too critical, um, I observe an enormous number of people around the planet doing things that are not uh, going to have the impact they would like them to have. I mean, for example, I know a huge number of anti-war activists, uh, vast numbers. I've known heaps of people all my life. I've been quite prominent in the anti-war movement in my own way. But um, but I, I sadly, I understand that a lot of what they're doing is not going to have any impact on the mm -hmm. problem of war because it's just not focused as part of what they do on addressing the cause. And if you're not doing that, if you're not addressing, you know, I mean, if, if your car's broken down, you've got to understand exactly why it's not working. Yeah. Uh, if you're going to do the appropriate repair to the engine to get it working again, you, you can't just, you know, presume there's something wrong with one part and fix something else and ignore the, what caused the car to break down in the first place. And, yeah. you know, violence is no different. We have to understand the cause. So, yeah. So, um, 
it's been my passion to understand that cause and since 2010 when Anita and I came out of seclusion to um, to raise awareness of that and try to mobilize people to to deal with it now I've got to say there's one big problem it's not a simple or pleasant cause uh, it requires real commitment to take on what that cause is and that's why violence has been so deeply entrenched within human civilization for millennia right and it's not going to be easy to get us out of this mess but on the other hand i'd still rather you know try to get us out of the mess by understanding the cause and applying a strategy to address that cause no matter how unpleasant it is because at least it can work so is this the right time to ask you that magic question? So what, what have you discovered? How, how do you convey that? How do you put that into a, <clears throat> a verbal packet so that a knucklehead like myself can understand it? <laughs> sure, no worries. Um, yes, well, um, I had a, uh, a critical moment in my own journey, which came on the uh, 12th of October, 2007 it was uh, just after midnight I was lying in bed and I was and I was living in a tent in the forest at that point because Anita and I had to live our most of our time in seclusion in a tent out in the forest because we had very little money I was lying in a tent and I still remember the moment and uh, it was 40 41 years three months and 11 days after I'd committed myself to find this answer and I was lying there pondering the fact that uh, it, it had become really clear to Anita and I through our years in seclusion, because by that stage we'd had 11 years in seclusion, though close enough, that there was a big problem in the way humans were parenting their children. And fundamentally, what human beings call socialization is simply um, a polite way of saying that humans terrorise their children into doing what the adults want. So it doesn't matter what culture you look at or what period of history, what we consistently can see without even sort of doing too much research on that given our circumstances at the time, was that if you just uh, considered any culture, any time, if a child is born into a particular culture, they end up taking on all the aspects of that culture pretty well without question. Because if they ask questions about the adult society in which they're born, they get punished. They might get some superficial answers originally, but if they start to rebel against that culture, to object to it in any way, they get punished. Now, it's far more simple uh, than that. So for example, if a child just does something that an adult doesn't like, it just disobeys a simple order, it will be punished. Now, punished is a word we use to obscure from ourselves the fact that we're being violent to the child. Okay, let's look at some of the things. Um, we're violent in a physical way, we hit children. We're violent in a verbal way, we scream at them, we yell at them, we abuse them. Uh, we're violent at them in other ways, like we might lock them these days into a bedroom, uh, punish them by telling them they can't do a certain thing. We're always shaping the behaviour of the child by punishing the child. That is inflicting violence. It takes many forms. I, we decided in the end to divide it into visible violence. That's the stuff you can see when you hit them, when you sexually abuse them, when you yell at them, scream at them. Uh, abuse them in any way that's really obvious to anyone observing. But the real damage is done tragically, despite how bad all that visible violence is, the real damage is done by the invisible violence and the utterly invisible violence. Okay, what's the invisible violence we inflict on children? Here's a short list, but if you want to read the document Why Violence, you can read 230 of them. Don't listen to the child. What does the child do when the child says, mum, I need this, dad, I'd like to do that, and you ignore them? Okay, the child develops communication and behavioural dysfunctionalities because it's now trying to do something 
without the help that evolution in effect told it would get. The child is given communication skills and a behavioral capacity to carry out its own will. Every time an adult doesn't help the child to do that or ignores it, 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 it gives the child nowhere to go. And we're talking babies, right? One-year-old children, you know? So just not listening to a child is enormously damaging. Now, a child is genetically functional. If it wasn't, no species would survive. Everything is functional when it's born, unless, unless it's got some serious disability, which some do. You might have a, an individual born with missing a leg or something. But fundamentally, everything's born genetically whole, and it's capable of living in a certain environment, in a social setting, provided it gets listened to as it expresses its needs, right? Okay, so we don't listen to a child. That's a form of invisible violence. Here's a list, a brief list, okay? Mm -hmm. If you blame a child, if you condemn a child, if you insult a child, if you mock a child, if you embarrass a child, if you shame a child, humiliate, taunt, guilt trip, goad, bribe, blackmail, judge, I could go on. There's 230 of these listed. Now, there's not a parent on the planet who doesn't do a whole swag of these 230 things almost on a daily basis and certainly over the course of the child's life. Some people don't do some things. Right. Okay, what does it do to a child to be blamed, condemned, insulted, mocked, shamed, embarrassed, humiliated, taunted? It teaches them, first of all, to ignore themselves, the part of themselves that's driving them. Every, every human is born with an innate a self-will, a capacity to, to be itself, but it, it's got to be nurtured or it doesn't flower. Okay, so it teaches the child to blame, condemn, insult, mock, humiliate, embarrass, shame other people. So we teach a child to do all the things. We even teach children to bribe and to blackmail, and then, of course, legal. when they're older, that's illegal. Parents do it to kids all the time. They bribe and they blackmail. You know, they do all sorts of things. Okay, now that's... That's one level of damage that's not readily recognised, but there's a third level, and this is the really cruncher. This is the one that really locks it in and makes it painful. If you blame a child, they feel bad. Now, each child's response will be unique, but it'll be some version of they feel sad, they feel scared, they feel angry, they feel dread, they might feel guilt, they might feel shame, they'll feel things in response to the fact they've been blamed, condemned, insulted, guilt tripped, goaded, whatever. They'll always have an emotional reaction. But parents do not like children to have emotional reactions. They just want the child to do what they're told. And so because the child has an emotional reaction to the violence they've just suffered, the blame, for example, which may or may not be for a good reason, it doesn't matter, who wants to be blamed, you know? The child has an emotional reaction, but the parents interfere with the child's capacity to have that emotional reaction. So let's say the child cries, which is the simplest example. The child gets ignored or blamed or goaded or something, and it suddenly feels sad and it bursts into tears. But if the parents are not willing to let the child have that emotional reaction fully and completely, the child does not recover from what caused it the goading, guilt tripping, the blame, whatever. Mm -hmm. They might feel scared. They might feel angry. So the child will have a, one or a series of emotional reactions to what's happened. They might cry. They might feel scared. They might you know, get angry. Um, they might feel guilty. If the child is not listened to at that key point to let it fully express those feelings, the child will suppress the awareness of the feeling and also what caused it. Okay, that's one simple incident. That could take 30 seconds. The parent insults the child, the child feels hurt, the child starts to cry, the parent says don't cry or comforts the child or hits the child, stops it expressing the emotional reaction. The child has no choice but to suppress its aware their awareness of that reaction. That goes deep into the unconscious and then a minute later, and an hour later, and a day later, and a week later, the next thing gets piled on top. Children all the time suffer the invisible violence 
of having things happen to them. And again, it might be simple as, mum, can you help me? Mum doesn't want to help, she's busy. Dad, can you do this for me? Dad doesn't want to do it, he's busy. Um, any number of these 230 types of invisible lines, and then fundamentally, when the child has an emotional reaction to that, that reaction is either ignored, perhaps they're comforted to shut the reaction down, they might be reassured, which will tend to shut the reaction down, they might be distracted, uh, they might be laughed at or ridiculed, um, they might be terrorised into not expressing the feeling by being screamed at. Don't you get angry at me. Um, they might be violently controlled. They might be locked in their room, for example. So you've got visible violence. It's when we yell at, scream at, hit, uh, abuse in some very obvious, probably a physical way. And everyone knows that's what it is. Sexually abused, often. Um, but invisible violence is when we do the more subtle things, the, the insults, the condemning, the blaming, you know, the mocking, embarrassing, shaming, humiliating, that sort of stuff. That happens all the time. We, we use that as a disciplinary measure. Teachers do it all the time, standard procedure. Um, and then the key bit is really when the fact, the, the emotional reaction the child has to either being hit or abused in some way or insulted or embarrassed is when they're not allowed to have the emotional reaction to, to that. And that means they then suppress that emotional reaction and they suppress, in effect, the awareness of what happened to them. And that just sort of happens incidentally. Now, can you imagine this, Dean? You've got a child who, from the moment of birth, at the moment of birth, every child is a free agent. It could be anything. And it could be born in the middle of Australia or in the middle of Africa, uh, or the middle of South America, and it's got the potential to be anything. You could move it to any location on the planet at that moment, and it, could, it wouldn't matter where it was born. You could raise it in another culture. It can do anything. But every parent wants that child to do exactly what that parent wants, and not, if not exactly, pretty close. Okay, and what we do is we either smash them physically, we smash them, with invisible violence, just insult, condemnation, whatever, but all the things that we need to shape its behaviour to our satisfaction. And then we don't let them have their emotional reaction to that. In the end, you put a child in school for 12 years, where all day, every day, it's just told what to do, more or less, given a tiny bit of freedom, you know, maybe they can choose what colour pen they do their painting with for a while or something. But the entire framework is a classroom that's set up. They're not given a choice whether they go into that classroom each morning or each period after recess or lunch. You know, they're not given any choice about the content of the class unless occasionally the teacher says, okay, what do we want to do today? You know, uh, but they never say, what do you want to do for the next 12 years of your life? Yeah. Do you want to go to school or do you mm -hmm. want to be yourself? Um, and at home, it's the same thing. You know, every day you're being shaped to be what society says you want. Now, what society has done by doing this over the last several thousand years is produce an extraordinarily dysfunctional species. It's called Homo sapiens. That is, it's us human beings. And now they stand around and wonder why the hell we fight wars, engage in mass slaughter, we're destroying the environment, why some people are racist, some people are sexist, why indigenous people have just been forced out of their cultures and lands because you know Europeans think they know better than Native Americans or South Americans or the Aboriginal people of Australia or wherever. Um, we have created a vastly dysfunctional species and all, it all gets back, um, and I can see it very clearly because obviously I've spent years uh, analyzing this and thinking about it, we just dysfunctionalize our children so profoundly that they completely lose sense of any awareness of who they were born to be. Yeah. Which was a unique organism, unique in the universe. Every human being, every, mm -hmm. every organism on this planet is unique. And we don't spend one moment really saying, okay, this baby at this moment, it's just exited the mother's womb 
It's, it's just derived on the planet. Mm -hmm. This baby is the most special organism that's been ever born in this moment. It has a unique destiny. What do we need to do to nurture that so that this baby will become the next Einstein, um, the next Leonardo da Vinci or whoever, yeah. you know, or, or just itself in its own unique way? And what unique contribution will that child be able to make to how our planet unfolds, to how our civilization? If, if I could just pause you for a second, because I, I, uh, going back to when you had us you know, kind of tracking through the school years that we all know so well. And, and, and thank you for the clear layout of the first and, and probably most uh, essential imprinting of what you're talking about at the parental child level and then how that's then systematized for 12 or more years straight of this is how you toe the line and this is what happens when you don't time and time again multiple multiple times every day that there's really no choice but to end up being well molded and and really concretized into the the desired shape for the what i call the business as usual yeah human operating system and exactly. you know the the one piece i wanted to kind of share from i'm i'm right in the middle of writing my second book and and have not nearly as as full a layout as what what you've put together but i've 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 thrown out some, some conjecture about what got us to this place. And one part of it is how did we become so deeply disempowered? You know, there's, there's, we can talk all day about the evil influences and the people in power and how they're holding on to that power and they've manipulated the, the structures to be as seamless and as potent as they've become. But certainly we've had our peace in it at least in an unconscious way, you know, we participated and we may not have had much choice in that participation, but we, we were there. Mm. And the, the words that I, I use, I'm using at the moment are that we, at, the, at some point, um, really had no choice but to completely forfeit our agency in life. Yep, that's right. We can have all kinds of fancy talk about creating our own reality or empowerment or, you know, life coaching, and you can have it all, and on and on it goes about how we think we have some kind of agency. But I think what's clear in, clearer in your layout, as you've just spelled it out, that really it's, it's like a tunnel, and that we have no choice but to just go be shot down that tunnel. And by the time we get out of it and, and have something like an adult life, we, um, we have completely forfeited our ability to have an authentic, uh, creative, sourceful relationship with our life. We, we at best, can be reactive is that safe to say in, in what you're laying out? Yep, exactly. Everyone is born a unique self, and by the time they're 5 or 10 or 15 at the absolute latest, they have taken on the socially constructed delusional identity that society gave them, and they then live a life basically yep. in accord with that, and that's exactly what you said. So none of, no, no human being is a truly unique self. Um, everyone's damaged. I've never come across an exception, not even historically. Um, and um, it took Anita and I 14 years to work off, hopefully, the bulk of it and maybe all of it. And we certainly now live our own lives. But, uh, you know, there's some tough individuals out there and I'm not going to pretend there's not. I mean, there's good activists trying to do good things that obviously include you, you know, so you've survived better than most. Um, but the bulk of the human population, gone, you know, and that's why it's so hard to mobilise them to participate actively and meaningfully in this crisis in which we now find ourselves. 
and the reality is, you know, that a, you know, a very small number of people run the planet. Their particular insanity uh, has led them to a place where they're in control of major, you know, global power structures. Uh, the global elite controls the, the economy. Um, but but 95% or 99% of the population is really just going along. Yeah. Don't want to ask questions as long as they can... Yes, you know, hide at home at night and perhaps go to a movie or you know, go on a nice holiday. Yeah, well, I, I couldn't agree with you more. That's certainly what I have seen in my life and, and particularly seen in these last five years as I've been deeply engaged in the, in the research for the book of uh, The Impossible Conversation. Robert, I, I'm wondering if you could give us some more uh, details about um, Flame Tree the Flame Tree Project, I believe it is, and um, and anything else that you're you're doing in terms of this kind of expression, um, what have you put together? You, you and your spouse have put together some some amount of uh, really courageous expression. So, um, can you tell us about it? Thank you. Yes, I think um, because um, my motivation was always to understand the problem so that I could you know, try and do something effective about it. Um, I've always been very interested in, if you like, making the connection between the analysis and, you know, understanding the cause as well. Um, a vision of how things might be and, uh, and a strategy that connects, gets us from our analysis to our vision of how we'd like it to be. So, um, uh, obviously, why, why violence is a key document that explains this violence in more detail that I've just been talked to you about what happens to children, and I believe that's the key because if we don't if we don't make our parenting of children and our adult treatment of children more functional, then we're not going to go anywhere. Um, but the Flame Tree Project was one of the several projects we developed coming out of our years in seclusion, which was designed to um, address the uh, the environmental crisis because as you're well aware of climate change has now um, put us into a, a really uh, short-term time frame uh, if we're serious about getting humans out of this mess in any form of um, organized life um, and possibly even averting extinction depending on how this scenario unfolds um, so the Flame Tree Project was an attempt to um, give people a pretty simple framework by which they could address all of the climate and environment issues simultaneously. Um, so what we did was we, we had a good think about what the, the key parts of the problem were and how we could design a fairly simple set of um, principles by which people could live if they wanted to make a big difference. So in summary, what we set out was that um, the seven key resources that humans use to uh, live their life and, um, and we need to reduce the consumption of those resources if we're to have an impact on all aspects of the, of the global ecology. Okay, so the seven key resources are water, household energy, vehicle fuel, paper, plastic, metals, and meat. And the idea was that we asked people to commit to reducing their consumption in each of those seven areas by 10% each year, but for 15 successive years. Now we designed this program back in 2008 so it's already 10 years old and we'd hoped we'd be able to mobilize a lot of people to get involved quickly and yeah if, if everyone's working on a 10 percent reduction of their water use household energy vehicle fuel paper plastic metals and meat 10 percent a year for 15 years it would mean that at the end of 15 years people are reduced uh, consuming about 20 percent of where they started and that's just a reduction in consumption and it's simple because look with the water, you, you, if you give up a shower a week, you'll, you'll do 10%. And uh, if you household energy, I mean, you just stop watching television for a night or, you know, vehicle fuel walk or catch a bus to work one day a week. You know, there's, there's really simple things you can do. Papers, just, just not getting a newspaper each day. Um, anyway, you've got the idea. It's very simple to actually cut 10% off your stuff. 
of your consumption of these seven areas. And then by the second year, well, maybe you miss two newspapers a week instead of one, you know, or you talk to your neighbor and you change your subscription so they get it three days, you get it four, you know. So we were trying to come up with something that we felt was simple that people could actually get up, get in and embrace, but it wasn't tokenistic because too often in the past, you know, a lot of the environmental recommendations have been confined to sort of don't take your plastic bags from the supermarket. Now that's a good idea, but it's not going to, it's got to be, we've got to do more than that. We've got to be beyond tokenistic. So 10% a year, for 15 years in each of seven areas, water, household energy, vehicle fuel, paper, plastic, metals, and meat. And they're the main areas of, um, they're the main resources that a typical human uses in a day. And they're all, we're all consuming them, if we live in the West anyway. And on top of that, we had a suggestion that um, people try to improve their self-reliance by 10% a year for 15 years in 16 areas. So it sounds a little more complicated, but we kept it a fairly brief explanation, a paragraph of time mostly. So try and improve your self-reliance in the area of health by 10% a year. So what does that mean? Well, uh, corporate medicine, unfortunately, is not doing a good job for human health. Um, and we need to look at all the alternative modalities. I know they're heavily criticised by a lot of people, but um, they have far more concept of nurturing a whole body with a, an intact immune system. And uh, and they're also much more inclined, inclined to sort of give you... Hmm, Robert, it looks like we've frozen up. I don't know if you can hear me, but I can no longer hear you and, and you kind of froze up there. Yeah. Don't know. Oh, there you go. There you go. We're better. That's much better. You know, uh, you were uh, really just laying out the um, the next level of detail about this uh, 10% a year over a number of years reduction. And, um, you know, if I could, I'd, I'd, I'd like to just pause you there because we will, co we will definitely uh, cover at the end um, how people can get a hold of the details of any of the pieces that we talk about. We'll get your website and links and so on. I'd like to just spend a couple of moments, if you would bridge in your own way, how did you end up putting the relationship with the earth and the environment into the container called violence? I have definitely have no question about it. No. It's a it's a big part of the work that I'm doing right now, the website and the, the new book and so on. But I'm so curious because you're one of very few people that I've uh, heard speak mm -hmm. that has made that connection. So can you tell us about how you sure. put those things together? Um, one of the interesting things about the uh, years in seclusion was that because we just spent 14 years in seclusion, we hardly saw a human being in that time. And we just spent the entire day exploring our own minds. And that meant, in my case, feeling a huge amount of fear. Uh, I didn't cry so much. Anita cried huge amounts. Uh, I also got angry at the last amount of the time, and so did Anita. Um, and because we kept releasing the feelings that we'd been suppressing all our lives, and that was, that was the secret, um, because we had to revisit all those suppressed feelings I was talking about earlier, feel the fear, the pain, the anger, the sadness, the dread, the shame, humiliation, whatever it was. Dig it all out one day at a time, one hour at a time, one minute at a time. Um, as we did that more and more, we just, um, I guess we just got more and more deeply in touch with in effect who we truly were. And it was actually fortunate that we had so few resources that we had to live in the forest because um, it meant that uh, we just lived in a small tent and uh, had a little bit of a cooking space. Uh, it just meant that, well, particularly for six and a half years solid, at one point we lived in the tent in the forest, quite secluded with a very rare human interaction. We went shopping every three weeks to get essential food. Um, we had this opportunity to feel our feelings in this wonderful natural environment. Now, the forest was pretty degraded, but it was still a forest. It had been logged but some years before. And it was quite remarkable 
to get up in the morning and you might have been feeling deeply fearful or sad or furiously angry or whatever, but to just go outside into the forest. And every day was different and every day taught you something. And it taught you something about the forest and it taught you something about life. And so you started to see the natural rhythm of life in the forest. Um, the cycles of insects, um, the uh, and you know just when I say the cycles, I mean sort of at one level the annual cycles, but also the cycles that happened over longer time frames. We were in the forest for six and a half years, and at one point these cicadas came out. They only came out once in the six and a half years. Mm. What happens to the rest of the time? Yeah, do they only ever come out every six years or ten or fifty? You know, we don't even know. You know. We did a little bit of homework since and that we found out that there's various species of cicadas and sometimes they don't come out for quite long cycles and mm -hmm. we were lucky. <laughs> so, but we observed wallabies and kangaroos and, you know, um, giant reptiles, we want to say giant, you know, one metre long reptiles um, uh, that Australia has that are rare now, but in that part of the forest, we Anyway, you get the understanding that I'm saying from this that we just got to observe nature. The area had previously been, um, obviously prior to 200 or so years ago, had been inhabited by Aboriginal people. And we came across occasional artifacts in the forest from their presence, particularly stone ax heads, mm -hmm. um, but other tools as well. We didn't have the knowledge to identify them, but you can tell by their shape that there's no accident and they had a purpose we didn't, even if we didn't know what it was. So I think the point about being in the forest was that it, it put us in touch with something about the ancient nature of the planet. And, um, and we'd both been environmental activists previously as well um, and um, been involved in environmental struggles. So um, as we unravel these feelings and because of the environment which we were living, it just became increasingly clear to us that, um, I mean, humans have just lost touch with nature. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, you live in a city, you don't even go out in the bush, you know, in Australia we call it the bush, you know, the mm -hmm. forest, the wilderness area. And so because humans have lost touch with nature and lost touch with themselves, I mean, they're really completely at a loss. There's no anchor in a modern human's life. They don't know who they are and they don't know anything about the natural world. What they know is how to survive in the city. And, and, and that's assuming they do what they're told to survive in a city. So instead of a self living out its own unique life in a natural setting with a deep appreciation of the wonder of nature and the wonder of the universe and you know, stargazing yeah. at night, the average modern human, particularly in a Western country, lives a socially constructed delusional identity within a socially constructed setting, which is yes. an industrial city setting. I mean, we're so disconnected from ourselves and from the real world, you know, that, I mean, it's, it's frightful. So anyway, the point is coming out of all this, we just realized that one of the projects we really had to, you know, put together and, an offer to people who, when we came out of seclusion, was this flame tree project, which helped people to pay attention to the physical realities in their life. You see, if we talk about water, household energy, fuel, paper, plastic, metals, and meat, I mean, it, it gives, it's a very mundane thing. Think about the water you're using. Thinking, when you eat meat, what is that? That meat was an animal. It was a life form. Do you really want to eat that? Or maybe we could be vegetarian, you know? So, so the whole purpose about it was, was to design something that functionally reduced consumption in a way that would have an impact on the Earth's biosphere, mm -hmm. but at the same time reconnect people with natural processes from which they'd been divorced by living in a city and by being told to do what they want, what to, what to do and go to school and get a job. And mm -hmm. I mean, the most freedom most human beings in the city get is what job they want. And that's defined by their capacities and economic opportunities and whether they're good enough to, you know, not just do some pretty slave job, you know, yeah. no, some, you know, theoretical sense. Um, so it, it came out of a, 
an understanding that if if we're so disconnected ourselves from the natural world, natural processes, the Earth's biosphere, uh, and so without a connection to self and a connection to the Earth, I mean, we're just, we're lost, you know. We are some social delusion, you know. And we wanted people to have a chance to reconnect with that and it felt that the Flame Tree Project both Give that gave them a chance to reconnect with themselves, with their neighbourhood, because there's other elements of the Flame Tree Project that are about working together with neighbours and streets or whatever, reconverting that street back into something more natural, take up the bitumen in some places, you know, wherever it's appropriate, you know, uh, become more self-reliant so that they're not dependent on a corporate economy, you know, a capitalist economy that's driving us to extinction at a rapid old rate. So, um, so it's an integrated project which allows them to reconnect with themselves, to reconnect with the local neighbourhood of people and to reconnect with the natural processes in which they're going to try and survive. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I guess you can see the connection pretty clearly. Yeah, it's it's uncanny. You know, it's, it's not that this is all that particularly unique uh, that you've come up with it or that I've come up with it, but our wording is almost identical. I'm happy to send you one of my books if that would be of interest. Um, and I, I think you'll just grin at how it, you know, we're, we're basically using the same words for the predicament we're in. I, I, I'm wondering if you've um, had the same challenge that I've had, uh, which is that there's very little language for many of the things we're talking about. You literally, I, my, my assertion is we literally have to uh, create a language for many of the, the distinctions that we're talking about. One I'd like to run by you that came up while you were just describing this last piece is um, it, <clears throat> how we have such a violent relationship with our habitat, with our home, with our ultimate mother, uh, Earth, is, is extraordinary to me. Um, and, you know, there's, there's one word that, one term that we use in our cultures, um, you know, fairly uh, frequently called willful ignorance. So certainly that's at play, but I, uh, to me, and I think in what I'm hearing in you, uh, it's actually far larger than that. And some, um, some suggest that this, this actually reflects a, a hatred that, that is somehow uh, being expressed through us, perhaps through that imprinting that we were talking about at the beginning. You know, I don't quite know what, what has added up to being this way, but we're now at a point where just a couple of, you know, I've got pages and pages of this sober data that has nothing to do with climate change. I'm, I'm sick to death of this climate change conversation, mostly because I, I can't find anything but cynicism, deep cynicism and really evil in the denial conversation. Mm -hmm. But in, in the many other metrics that we're facing on our planet, you know, just look at one of them. And at first, after it takes our breath away, how, how we're not scrambling to shift how we're being on the planet to give us give ourselves some sort of chance of survival, I, I can't figure it out. So to me, this is a place where we need a new language for our the, the scale of blind spots that we've got for the willful ignorance at some extraordinary other level. I don't know what the right word is for that, except that it looks to me like sort of a, a death wish, if you will. Um, there's, you know, uh, Derek Jensen, I, I don't know if you're familiar with his, his writing, but he talks a lot about this, that, that, uh, you know, what else could be driving us, but our truly some sort of innate hatred at this point from our cultural selves as an expression out into the world. You know, when, when we've got um, the what's now called year zero is the year when it's projected that the amount of wildlife, major fauna on the planet will be gone given how it's 
uh, decreased since since you and I were born. It looks like about 2026 mm. is year zero. Mm. Now, you know, if if other people were like us, it would be time to all hands on deck. We need to what the hell? But clearly, we don't have that. And and just one more. I mean, because I know you and I could both list off dozens. Mm. But the upwards of 80% of flying insects being gone in some regions, including pollinators. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. And we have a, a yawning, somewhat annoyed reaction like, oh, I wonder when this blabber mouth will finally shut up and I can get back to talking about something that amuses me. So I'm obviously letting my you know, my rant side come out. So thanks for putting up with that for a moment. I'm wondering if any if that sparks you to say anything. Yeah, I, I'm, tragically, um, I'm aware of these issues too because having been an activist all my life, um, I've uh, observed painfully at times how difficult it is to mobilise people to respond sensibly when a crisis is already smacking them in the mouth. Um, one of the tragic consequences of this violent, visible, invisible and utterly invisible violence that we adults inflict on children routinely as parents and as other adults in their life, such as teachers, religious figures and so on, we want to exercise this phenomenal control over their life, shape every last moment of it. Um, there's not a detail we don't uh, leave untouched in how they dress, how they behave, who they see, you know, how they interact. Um, where they're allowed to go and so on. Um, the child progressively submits out of fear to what's gone on and so that they become an obedient child and then an obedient adult who does what they're told. Um, there are three fundamental consequences of um, having the child submit in this way. One is that the child becomes terrified and that means they're terrified to be themselves, to do what they want, because they were never given that option throughout their entire childhood in any significant way, always at the margins. Maybe they're allowed to choose the party dress if they're allowed to go to the party, and it's got to be cut a certain way, or, you know, you get what I mean. So the child ends up terrified. Not a strong place to start if you want a powerful response to a crisis. The second thing that happens is that Every time an individual submits to the will of another and therefore to do that suppresses their own will, there is one fundamental outcome. The self-hatred goes up a significant notch. Yes. So anyone who understands the role of self-hatred in the world is right on the money. It's absolutely central. We're terrified. We're utterly self-hating. And that's because time and time and time again from the moment we're born we keep submitting to what we're you know told to do basically because the alternative is to get smashed and that's painful really painful in the end we choose to become to submit the right. body, but then suppress the awareness of what we've done and that's self-hatred but we're not aware of that the third thing is how can you feel powerful when you're never allowed to do anything, when you're never given a real choice, when you're never allowed to make a conscious decision for what you want to do and to act on it. There's a rare human being on this planet who feels powerful and certainly no one in the mainstream. So what we've got is, as adults, we've got the logical outcome of the smashing we do through to children throughout their childhood. We've got people who are terrified, self-hating and powerless. Then we turn around and say, hey, we've got an environmental crisis or we've got this war raging all over the planet or we've got, you know, insects are being decimated and, you know, rainforests are being destroyed and we've got this climate catastrophe. Now we want a powerful response so that we can get out of this. And we turn to, you know, 99.9% .9 of the population that's terrified, self-hating and powerless and say, you know, let's do something effective. That's why it's not working. Um, obviously, this is... Uh, nothing I celebrate at all. Um, and I spend a lot of my time trying to find ways around that. I 
and that's everything from people who want to heal. If they want to heal, I'm happy to help them do that and give them some good ideas about what they need to do and even offer listening in some contexts so that they can do their healing. Um, the Flame Tree Project attempts to allow them to gradually take on board the environmental crisis in a way that's you know not too painful for them but allows them to respond to reality even though i know that unconsciously they're terrified self-hating and powerless at some level at least you know but no one's escaped that um the most unpleasant experience of my 40 years in seclusion was feeling my own self-hatred terrified is a shocking feeling getting angry is actually quite liberating in its way you know yeah. feeling powerless is not pleasant Feeling self-hatred is the worst and feeling terrified is ugly. You know, it's not much fun. You, that, the only way you get rid of it is to feel it because it's there, you know. People don't do this sort of stuff. They go and see a counsellor or a psychologist or a psychiatrist. They get listened to superficially and get sent home. They're okay, you know. The deep psychology of every human is ugly and it's terror, self-hatred and powerlessness along with a bucket load of other stuff. There's one other problem that's deeply connected to this. When the child is being having its feelings suppressed, let's say let's say um, you scare a child and it starts to cry, but we don't want it to cry because that's reminding us we just scared it. Okay, we comfort it, maybe, and one of the things we might do is give them a lolly mm -hmm. or give them a toy. Now, if every time a child is crying, angry, frightened, or having any emotional response to what's going on, we give them something to eat or something to play with. We teach them one fundamental lesson that goes deep into their psychology from a very young age. They're in the high chair, right? And that lesson is, don't worry about feelings, acquire material things. So the child, at a very young age becomes addicted to acquiring food and or material things. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to think about a few people you might know who are a bit overweight or a few people you've heard about who've got a lot of money, then you're looking at people who are particularly badly psychologically damaged. Unfortunately, they could be skinny and they mightn't have too much money and they're still... So in this world, the competition, and this drives wars as well, you know, environmental destruction. The competition is for material resources because that's the thing we've been unconsciously taught matters. Uh, there's some, in, in a lot of indigenous cultures, there was a deep spirituality. That's what was valued. They didn't destroy the environment because the measure of their value to themselves and to those in their tribal group, if you like, was their spirituality or a cultural thing, whatever. Modern Western culture built on Capitalism measures value by material acquisition and we teach children to value material acquisition by offering them material things as substitutes for their feelings at a very young age. Mm -hmm. So the psychological connection with material acquisition and the destruction that necessarily requires in order to ultimately have that material, those material goods, um, is just an, out an outcome of that process. So we fight wars, we destroy the environment because we're trying to get resources. And if you're Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos or the Rothschild family or the really wealthy people in the world, I mean, these people are so chronically devoid of selfhood, the only measure of themselves that they or anyone else can see is how much stuff they've got. Now, I don't have much stuff, and neither am I homeless. In fact, we live in a tent still, how sit when we can, which is why I can now do this call. Um, but we have a self, we have a strong sense of self, that is we have a sense of who we are, uh, our place in the world and, uh, and, and the role we play in trying to make it a better place. You know, Material acquisition is not our bag, we'd probably prefer to have more resources so at least had somewhere to live permanently, you know, but given the choice we'd rather be ourselves and have a house. You know? Because to have a house we'd have to sell our soul, get a job somewhere for something meaningless compared to what we do. And then we'd have a house and we wouldn't have ourselves, our souls, you know. Most people choose the house, sacrifice the soul because that's what they were terrorised into doing as a child. It's not a conscious choice. I'm not being critical. What choice has a child got? It's, it's, right. it's, been born, it's one year old, it's in the high chair, it's crying, 
the parent stuffs food in its mouth or gives it a toy, the message is it's scared out of feeling its feelings and offered as compensation the teddy bear, the lolly, whatever. And it, it, it just deeply internalizes the sense that the value is in material things, not how I feel. Hmm. And so we've got a whole world of people now chasing goods, not spiritual enlightenment, emotional wholeness, uh, a sense of self. You, you, you can describe it any way you like, you know, religiously or otherwise. I don't mind. You know, it's just the point is, you know, the Gandhi had nothing. He had his cardi. He had a pair of spectacles and a pair of sandals. He had himself. He didn't need anything else. You know. Now you do need some other things. You need a bit of food, preferably three times a day. You know. You need. You know the basic things you need to live in the modern world, you know. But the reality is that the the psychological dysfunctionality of the global elite and, you know, any upper class person, the middle classes, and even a lot of people in working classes, you know, and even those indigenous people who've been co-opted into this world, you know. People have simply lost sense of what it means to be themselves. And so they now instead of that they've taken on the fact that material goods become who they are and they're addicted to it it's not an easy addiction to break yeah. no kidding um <clears throat> excuse me robert burroughs it's just it, it time has flown by and i kind of knew it would i knew there'd be so much resonance between your body of work and, and my own. I absolutely appreciate that. And I, if you're willing, I predict a number of other future get togethers uh, like this one. And uh, I, I'm before I um, start to wrap up our time together, I want to be sure to get people uh, the information that they need to be able to contact you, to be able to uh, get the far more detailed layout of the programs that you've created. So I'm wondering if you could start us out with, uh, you know, website and um, uh, particular articles that would uh, flesh out uh, some of the pieces that you've talked about today. Um, so if we could just handle those logistics for a moment, and then I have a a final round of, of question for you if you if you'd like sure um, probably in one sense the simplest thing is if people went to my website Robert J Burroughs .com, and it's Burroughs B U W R O W E S so Robert J Burroughs .com, everything else we've done is linked from that website so the flame tree project to save life on earth why violence, which explains the violence, the feelings first website, which puts together all of this emotional stuff and talks about the insanity of the elite and why that's happened and materialism, violence in war, which explains some of the points I was just making. Um, so probably the simplest is to go to my website and then just click on any link that interests you, including articles I write every fortnight or so. Um, yeah, so that, that should cover that. Okay, great. I like to, to finish up um, a, any given interview here on the Poetry of Predicament with um, a, an imaginary exercise for both of us. Imagine that this was actually part of mainstream media, had um, some number of millions of viewers and so on. And I'm curious if you had that kind of... Um, vehicle for expression what would you like to say to the people of the world fundamentally i tell them to start uh, trusting themselves by listening to how they feel and letting that guide how they behave now the problem is that you know we've all been so dysfunctionalized that the average person could well interpret, do what I feel in, a, in, in what 
in effect a very dysfunctional way that that could be to go and watch a movie or read an ice cream you know it's not really what i mean of course um but nevertheless uh, despite the risks um I, I think the only way back for any of us to understanding our true selves and what the universe had in mind for us you know general sense at the moment of our birth is to get back in touch with how we feel and there's a website called feelings first blog which um Amita and i have explained how to do that and there's an article called putting feelings first and it's an attempt to explain how people can reconnect with their deep emotional self and the, the great tragedy of the modern world is that emotional expression feelings have been given a bad rap they're seen as irrational in fact, uh, the person who's deeply disconnected from their emotional self is a highly irrational individual and has no grounding in millions of years of evolution in you know, working out what's right for them or the planet. So um, the fundamental message would always be to encourage each person to allow some time in their life to explore their own inner self as deeply as they can and to listen to children to let those children grow up with the opportunity to um to be themselves and that that's not easy because i'm afraid i can't see any good in school um obedience is not the way to get someone to understand their own self-will and to be everything that evolution gave them the potential to be um, and if parents were willing to listen to children rather than tell them what to do, they'd soon find no child wanted to stay in school. Or they might try it for half an hour and say, why would I sit in this class with this bunch of kids and being told what to do by this person? You know, I mean, anyone with still will doesn't obey, you know. It doesn't mean we can't have all sorts of social arrangements that work to our convenience. It's great to drive on the same side of the road, assuming we've got a car. Uh, then we don't all crash. I mean, there's all sorts of conventions that are useful but we don't have to have everyone surrendering themselves to follow the rules whether it's home school or society if we trust um, the innate capacities of humans and nurture them properly through childhood uh, we could have a, a global population of enormously powerful uh, focused um, ecologically um, astute and aware uh, people um, who live in harmony with themselves, each other, and nature, and know how to deal with conflict without killing each other. You know, so we've, we're so far from you know what each human being could be. My fundamental message has always got to be: look inside yourself, feel. If you're scared, you're angry, you're sad, whatever, feel it. Let it teach you what it is. It mightn't even be much fun, but it'll teach you really powerful stuff. And it's only by doing that and listening to children so they do that that we can get each person back on the track of where we need to go. Whether we've got time is a big problem. Perhaps we haven't, but it's still the fundamental thing I'd, I'd encourage and invite everyone to do, to go on the journey to understand who they were meant to be. Boy, believe me, that is far better than getting on top of Everest or yeah. walking on the most pleasant place on the planet. Who were you meant to be? It ain't this person who's got a job in some, doesn't matter what job it is. There's no job on the planet that's worth not being who you were meant to be. Yeah. Go in search. Yeah, brilliant, brilliantly put. And <clears throat> again, I just want to thank you for, uh, for the work that you've been doing, obviously, your whole life, and, and particularly in the way that you and Anita have done it. Um, I don't know if this is going to communicate, but it's part of uh, kind of the the lineage that I've uh, grown up in, in in ways of communicating, and particularly in the in the training world as we acknowledge one another. As um, Robert, I'd like to I'd like you to know that I see you. I see you, and I uh, so appreciate the core of what I am feeling and what I'm experiencing and hearing from you. Uh, and I honor it. Thanks very much. I honor you. I appreciate I, that. I, uh, 
I don't know if it's your reality, but I think it's um, in this world that we've been describing, you and I, indirectly in this call, um, in this world, there is very little seeing or appreciation or honoring of that which is actually bringing life. Yeah. So um, I thank you so much for all that you've done and the years and years that you've put into it. And um, I look forward to uh, any other opportunities we get to speak together again. And heck, maybe there's more than that to happen. Who knows? Great. Thank you, Dean. I look forward to it too. All right. I'm... Thanks for watching another episode of the Poetry of Predicament podcast produced by Dean Walker and the Living Resilience Alliance. www.livingresilience.net Music today from Michael Hedges, as always, and also Port Blue into the Sea. You may want to check out our sister podcasts, the New Lifeboat Hour with Carolyn Baker on Podbean and at carolynbaker.net. Also, the Impossible Conversation podcast, another channel on YouTube. Thanks so much for joining us. Join us again later for another episode of The Poetry of Predicament.